I am Mahmoud Al Rafai from the Circulation COVID team. I'm joined by Dr. Giuseppe Ferrante from the Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan, Italy. Thank you so much for being part of our initiative, uh, Circulation COVID. Uh, we want to get your perspectives on how your center and region have led initiatives to, uh, to really battle COVID-19 and want to benefit from the lessons you've learned, uh, particularly while dealing with the cardiovascular complications of the disease. big issue now is STEMI patients with COVID-19 or ACS patients coming in with COVID-19. Have you been seeing some of those ACS patients and um, what kind of presentations do they present with and how are you managing them? First of all, let me, let me thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, in order to address the issue of acute coronary syndrome, still we do not have clear data whether this type of infection would modify the incidence of acute coronary syndrome patients in these countries. We may think that as it may happen in the course of a viral infection, like influenza, this could be a precipitating factor. Once uh, we have said this, uh, our approach is based on the uh, protection OD providers of healthcare, as well as all the patients in the hospital. So we start from the emergency room with a specific triage of this type of patients with a specific protective devices. And uh, if there is evidence by AKG that there is an ongoing still emission regarding infarction, our pathway is uh, to go straight to the cat lab. So all the nurses and physicians that will be involved in this uh, uh, pathway will be protected and the patients will undergo emergency coronary angiography and eventually primary PCI. In case we have to deal with a non-ST elevation and human regarding infarction, there's been a change in the policy in the uh, Lombardy region uh, where we are, because uh, 13 uh, centers have been selected as uh, hub centers that they have to deal with acute coronary syndrome. So if we could stabilize patient in a hospital, which is just a spoke, and it is not a hub by medical management, we may then send the patient eventually to another uh, spoke hospital in order to treat these patients uh, by uh, non-urgent coronary angiography. Any uh, data on using thrombolytics uh, for STEMI patients? Well, with this network, we are trying to keep the primary PCI as the first option for this patient. So we did not have uh, the need so far to use thrombolytic and in, region, uh, in our region. So that's, I think it's a good thing, but we will have to face also a delay in order to balloon time uh which may be also an issue to deal with in this regard however i would like to say that this type of patients may present with uh, a syndrome which may mean a can acute coronary syndrome but it is not indeed uh, a true acute coronary syndrome because the AKG abnormalities may reflect ongoing myocardial damage perhaps due to myocarditis and it is uh, we, we we have seen this already in patients presenting with clear st elevation myocardial infarction and we were found to have a remarkable coronary arteries so our approach still in this case i think could be uh, still useful to uh, continue with an emergency coronary angiography when there is a high suspicion of uh, ST elevation regarding infarction, because this may avoid the use of uh, uh, unwanted lytic in this issue, which increase would otherwise increase the bleeding and will be not uh, uh, at all effective. Um, other things clinicians have been seeing is an incidence of cardiomyopathy. We know most of those patients have underlying heart failure and then may develop also uh, cardiomyopathy as a result of COVID. Uh, so can you tell us about your experience with cardiomyopathy and heart failure when it comes to COVID patients? Uh, 
So the first thing we are going to do in these patients is to try to assess myocardial damage by serial assessment of cardiotrombonin and CKMB. According to uh, literature, we have seen that there is a cardiac involvement ranging between uh, 4 to 5 percent up to 20 percent of cases. And the extent of troponin elevation has been associated with disease severity as well as in, in some cases with mortality. Still, to make a clear diagnosis about the type of cardiac involvement, we need to do uh, serial echocardiography examinations. But I think that uh, a key uh, diagnostic tool would be the use of cardiac MRI in order to try to understand whether there is an inflammatory damage to the heart, in other words, whether there is a high probability of myocarditis. In this regard, we may not rule out that in the most severe form of uh, COVID-19 pneumonia complicating with acute distress respiratory syndrome, there could be also a uh, fulminant myocarditis leading to cardiogenic shock. And this probably may reflect the ongoing cytokine storm that has been uh, uh, detected in this context. We know that there is a high elevation of interleukin-6 as well as uh, of other inflammatory markers. And there is also ongoing research, at least in Italy, but I've seen also in China, to try to see whether tackling uh, with a specific blocker of the interleukin-6 receptor, like tochlitzumab, uh, which may counterbalance the inflammatory response of the host, uh, there could be a, a, a significant uh, impact on the outcome of these patients. Right. There is an ongoing randomized trial addressing the uh, impact of this drug in Italy. Uh, still, I think that the inflammatory pathways of this disease may be multifactorial. And there is some line of evidence that they have also shown that there may be a response mediated by lymphocyte T helper 17. And we know that this subpopulation of lymphocyte may also be associated with uh, an increased production of interleukin-17. So we could consider also to study in a better and a more deeper manner these patients in terms of inflammatory profile to see whether additional drugs, such as specific interleukin-17 receptor blockage, that to my knowledge have been already used in the context of other disease such as psoriasis could be for instance useful also in some specific cases in this disease. We've seen there's a high incidence of cardiomyopathy in COVID-19 patients. Uh, we know there's a major role for non-invasive assessment of cardiac function with echo and, and MRI. Uh, Dr. Ferrante, what what do you think is the role for more invasive hemodynamic measurements with small GAMs um, so regarding the hemo hemodynamic changes in those patients? This is an important question. The use of small GAMs may provide us with additional key information. However, the disease in the most severe cases is dominated by the acute respiratory distress syndromes. And in this uh, setting, also the peak of which uses a combination of techniques for advanced hemodynamic and volumetric monitoring it may be an additional tool or an alternative tool because it may provide us with additional information in terms of extravascular lung water. Uh, the clinical picture may be like a sepsis, so there might be a, a so-called, uh, I mean, a septic lung uh, disease. And uh, in this specific issue, I think that the um, use of one GANS alone may not be sufficient. Uh, so, Dr. Ferrante, uh, with regards to arrhythmias, uh, what kind of arrhythmias have you noted in those patients? And uh, what kind of patients develop arrhythmias? We have seen that uh, there is a uh, um, arrhythmia related to the drugs patients is receiving. For instance, acquired lung QT syndrome and uh, ventricular arrhythmia induced by lung QT syndrome in the context of antiretroviral drugs. 
or promoted also by hydroxychloroquine, which is uh, currently used in Italy. Uh, most often these patients are also on the prophylactic uh, azithromycin. And therefore the combination, although these drugs may increase the risk of acquired lung QT syndromes. And we have seen already some ventricular fibrillation induced by this type of disease. In the context of acute myocardial damage, such as myocarditis, we may, uh, however, see also ventricular arrhythmia, arrhythmia, which are related to the disease itself. So um, we have these two different spectrum of uh, uh, bradycardia and the ventricular, ventricular arrhythmia induced by bradycardia. How did you manage those patients? For the first uh, cases, uh, in case of acquired lung QT syndrome, it was uh, quite useful to stop antiretroviral viral drugs to have a short period of, uh, if there was bradycardia, increase the heart rate by uh, drugs in order to remove the trigger. And as soon as the QT returns to normal values, the uh, arrhythmic tricks usually disappear. We also know that some of those patients have developed venous thromboembolism, uh, particularly one complication with DPE. Um, so what proportion of patients that you've been managing develop DE? And do you think it was, this proportion was higher in other, otherwise similar patients that did not have COVID? This is an interesting issue. I've seen that there is no clear statement about the type of anticoagulation these patients should have in order to reduce the risk of uh, VT. However, our standard approach, which is in line to most uh, recommended guidelines, is to provide prophylactic uh, low molecular weight uh, uh, heparin uh, as soon as a diagnosis has been performed. It is quite uh, uh, plausible that the inflammatory milieu uh, may increase the risk of thrombotic complications. And therefore, I think that this is uh, the standard approach that you could probably see in this type of uh, inflammatory and infective disease with uh, enhanced systemic inflammation. The effect of uh, inflammation may have effects on cardiovascular function, but also may have atherosclerotic function on the uh, atherosclerotic effects on the vessels. Um, any insight as to what kind of research we should be looking at for uh, atherosclerosis in COVID? Yeah, we know that the same pathways involved in the myocardial damage may probably affect also the risk of acute current syndrome because uh, uh, acute current syndrome has a huge uh, uh, background in terms of inflammatory mechanisms. So it is likely that uh, the risk may be of having an acute MI may be increased during this type of disease. Still, we do not have data showing that this is the truth. I cannot thank you enough uh, for being with us today. We know how busy you are. You've been on the, really on the front lines of battling this disease. So I just wanna thank you again for taking the time, talking with us today, helping us advance our knowledge in this disease, COVID-19 and the cardiovascular complications. Thank you.